Well, it's a privilege to be here with you. Greetings from Australia, everybody. And uh, congratulations on an incredible um, hosting of the world uh, during the, the Olympics. And congratulations on such a great result uh, for this nation. Uh, well done. Um, yeah, we were, um, those of us that were watching the Olympics via the uh, television were just really blessed by the hospitality and uh, the welcome that uh, the UK gave to all the athletes, both particularly within the Olympics and the Paralympics was really outstanding and um, I think it touched many hearts around the world and uh, really encouraged people a great deal. Um, and I just want to thank you for that. It was just a great example and I think a good step up for future Olympics. So, And bless you on great results. You guys must feel very pleased. Well done. You seem to be beating Australia at everything at the moment. Does that make you feel good? Uh, for those of you that are into sport, it's got to make you feel good. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, yeah, it's great to be here with Rick and Louie and... Uh, all of you at St Paul's and uh, it's been a great privilege to be here for this last year and also in the city of London. God's been doing a great deal in the city. Um, miraculous things have been happening, signs and wonders, people's lives been changed. Um, one of the, the biggest things that I've really noticed, particularly in London, is the greater increase of unity within boroughs with a determination and a desire uh, to together reach a city, to together reach a borough. So there has been a, 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 a amazing um, unity issues in various boroughs around the city where they've developed strategy and said, we can do this, we can really take our part of the city for Jesus. And it's been a privilege for us as a mission to be here. Uh, we've come from all over the world. Um, half, probably about half of the workers have come out of uh, Perth, Australia, and uh, the other 50% have come out of about, representative of about 30 other YWAM locations around the world that have sent uh, two or three teams during the year. And so far we're up to a, a little over 800 workers that have been in the city this last year. So we thank you for your generosity and your hospitality uh, toward Youth with a Mission. Now, I hear that you've been talking about a series called Irres uh, which has been entitled Irresistible Jesus. Well, that's got to be my favourite topic because Jesus is my favourite person to talk about and he is incredibly irresistible in every way and for all of us probably at a deep and a personal level, he's changed our lives. Uh, you know, you, when you see him, you love him. Uh, just knowing Jesus is incredibly transforming. Uh, as you get to know him more and more, uh, the more and more we are changed uh, to be like him. And um, for my life, it's completely different. Uh, it's, like, uh, it's like the North and the South Pole difference as far as Jesus coming into my life and the transformation that's come. And ever since that point in my life, there's no one uh, that I'd rather be with there's no one that I'd rather talk about. There's no one that I'd rather go to the nations and share about. I am absolutely convinced that he is the answer to this world and he is the one that will bring transformation in every community, every city and every nation. So just excited to be a part of this series. Hope I don't wreck it in any way. Um, apparently today uh, you, you, the, the focus is on irresistible creator and uh, we just had that passage from Mark 4 uh, just shared uh, with us, just read out, Mark 4, 35 to 41. Now, this is an exciting passage of Scripture because basically it's a passage where Jesus is on his way somewhere. He, he's, he's got purpose. And what he does is he, he gathers his disciples and he says to them, let's cross to the other side of the lake. Now, that's not a random thing. It's not a thing where he decides, okay, we want to go fishing. Uh, the lake looks great today. Let's play on it. It's got, it's got to do with purpose that Jesus had on the other side of the lake. 
And um, so they all climbed into a boat together and they started out. And um, the disciples would not have realized that there was purpose involved in what Jesus was intending to do. But Jesus was very clear on his purpose. He fully understood why he needed to go across to the other side of the lake. So he was very calm. He was very cool. And he went to the back of the boat. Uh, the, the scripture says, in my, in my version anyway, that he found a pillow He laid down and uh, he got into a very, very deep sleep. Now, during that sleeping time, there was this fierce storm uh, that broke out and uh, it was a pretty intense storm. Uh, It must have been fairly intense because we know that uh, a good proportion of the disciples knew how to handle boats. They knew what to do on the water, but yet this storm was so fierce that it was rolling in. Uh, to the boat and um, it was causing problems. And during that time, Jesus was was still asleep. He was completely relaxed. And, um, you know, and sometimes... Sometimes, I don't know about you if you've experienced this, but I've found that on the way to doing something great, on the way to purpose, on the way to the things that God speaks to us about that can literally change community, our neighbors, people's lives, uh, there's fierce storms that break out. Uh, Very often, we call that the attack of the enemy. There's an intensity of attack Uh, that can drive us very often into despair. Uh, There was an intensity of attack here in the form of a storm. Um, And it certainly um, drove the disciples into despair. And when you're in despair and when you feel like things are a little bit out of control, you can feel incredibly isolated. And uh, you can feel a bit abandoned. And sometimes you can get a little bit irrational. I don't know if any of us have got a little bit irrational at times. Um, In this situation, the disciples got a little bit irrational and um, they knew they were in trouble. Uh, The boat was about to sink, according to them. They were scared. They were upset. And so they, they began to do something that was a little bit strange. They started to shout at Jesus. They started to yell at him. They started to accuse him and blame him. And they said, don't you care? Now, we have a world outside of this church that is making that accusation toward God all the time. Don't you care? You see, because they don't understand and know and have personal relationship with the Lord. They're in storms of life. They're experiencing incredible difficulty and challenge. And it's very, very real. Even people inside this church today may be experiencing incredible difficulty and challenge. And whether we've spoken it out or thought it, Perhaps we think the same thing of God. Perhaps we ask the same question, don't you care? We're going to drown. We're beyond our depth. We're sinking. You know, in, in, in the world that we live in right now, there are nations that are crying that out. To the heavenlies or to anybody that will listen, don't you care? We're drowning. We're beyond our depth. We're not coping. We're not coping with life. We're not coping with our situation. We're not coping with our jobs. We're not coping with what you call the great commission, Jesus, that we're meant to be doing to impact the world. We're not coping with just daily life. And this was a situation here because we had an experienced group of fishermen And they came and they began to shout. It is fairly irrational when you start shouting at Jesus. It means that you're beyond your depth. It means that you've got personal issues that are being exposed because you can't control the situation. And so what we do in those situations is that we begin to point the finger. And normally at the one that we love or people that we love, we begin to attack, we accuse, we blame. And you know, so many of the people that I've ministered to over the last few decades in missions have, you know, there's issues of blame that we've got to get set free of, that we've got to get light on in our heart toward God. Questions that we have of God, why did you allow that to happen? That's very often a question that we're often dealing with in counseling situations, in ministry situations, because we have either spoken or unspoken accusations toward God, very often because we don't know him as well as we need to know him. We don't understand his nature and character as well as we can and as well as he wants us to know him. 
And so from that attack and accusation and blame, don't you care type of communication can either be spoken or unspoken toward God and toward those that we love, to those that we look to to bring protection in our life. Very often when we're speaking out those things, it's also the point where we could be potentially seeing an extraordinary miracle. And this was the case with with the disciples. They're at a point where they were able or about to see a miracle and they didn't know it because they didn't understand God's ways in this situation. So eventually they woke Jesus. So they were successful at that. The shouting actually woke him up. And um, Jesus got up immediately and the Bible says that he rebuked the wind. He rebuked the waves. He said to the wind, be silent. He said to the waves, be still. Now it's not every day that you can get someone to walk out uh, in in a lake in a fierce storm of any nature and say, be quiet and be still. But yet they're in a boat with someone that could, with someone that understood and knew his Father God, someone that had authority, someone that could speak in this way. You know, when I was praying over this passage of Scripture, I was thinking about the many voices that are out there that are speaking against God. You see... The more we get to know God, the more we understand that he is the powerful voice. Because that it happens. At the very beginning of creation, he spoke and the world as we know it began to exist. And then as we go down through the generations, as God has been speaking and leading, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and now with us in, in, in the church today, That when God speaks, things happen. He has a powerful voice. But very often we, even as the church, have given ourselves, if you like, have sold ourselves to many other voices. We listen to many other voices and they almost become equal with the voice of God. They almost carry as much power and sometimes they carry more influence than the voice of God. And these voices lie to us. Uh, They create confusion and fear. These voices seek to control us. And we have authority, you know, as the church, and uh, we're very aware of that particular scripture and uh, where Jesus said that all authority in heaven and earth I give to you. That Jesus was in a preparation mode with his disciples to pass on something. It was called authority. But it wasn't authority that was attached to us already. It's authority that can only come from the living God. And, and you know, these voices that we have in the world are voices that are both um, out there that we can clearly visualize. They're voices that are visible, but there's also invisible voices. You know, I was just thinking about it during worship. It's a little bit like protocol. There, there are protocol in nations, communities, boroughs, cities. It's both visible and invisible protocol, and it tells you what you can and what you cannot do. But you know, there was protocol when Jesus lived as well, and it was trying to tell Jesus what he could and could not do. But he did not listen to those voices. He only listened, the scripture says, to the voice of his father. And he only did what his father told him to do. We need to silence all other voices. We need to silence voices around us. We need to silence the voice of the enemy, the fierce storm that would seek to come against us. We need to silence the voice of lies, the spirit of control that would stop us from being men and women of God, that could do the things that God is telling us to do so that the kingdom of God would be seen and heard on our streets and in our city. If we don't silence those other voices, both invisible and visible voices, we're in danger of abandoning the purposes of God in our generation. You see, every generation has a responsibility with the gospel and the Great Commission to take it to their generation. But yet, as I travel the world, there are so many voices in nations that say, well, that's not the way we do it in our particular nation. 
And often, you know, I'll come to another nation, another city, and they'll say exactly the same thing, thinking that their particular city is unique. No city is unique in the sense of the lies of the enemy and the voices that try and control the church and close the church down. We, are, we exist as a church for our non-members, not for our members. We exist for the people that don't yet know. We exist for our generation that has never heard and had the privilege of knowing Jesus, of understanding what it means to be transformed by the power of God. But yet if we don't close down the other voices, this city and this area of London will never hear the voice of God because we're the called out ones, if you like. We're the ones that have been called into our communities to to make God known. And we don't want to be the generation that abandons the purposes of God. You know, we, we need to be the ones that cry out for God to move in supernatural ways and be prepared that God would point the finger at us and say, I want you to go and do this, against protocol, against voices of society that say that's not the way we do it. What we've got to be asking the question is, what would Jesus do in this situation? How would he respond and how would he act? We can't afford to run in fear. We can't afford to blame God for situations in community. We can't afford to allow our community to blame God. We must take Jesus into the streets of our city. You know, in this situation in Mark 4, the storm suddenly stopped at Jesus' command. Wow. Wouldn't you love to have been in the boat, not in the storm bit, but (laughs) that was part of getting to the miracle, yeah? I would love to have been in that boat. I would have hoped to have, uh, I would hope that I wouldn't have been yelling at Jesus, but possibly I probably right, would have been right in the middle of all that, still needing to know God better, still needing to understand his ways. But Jesus stood up and he, he silenced the storm. He did a miracle. He, 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 he was all powerful in that situation. But then he did something that was even more powerful to me. He turned to his disciples and he asked them two questions. The first question was, why are you afraid? You know, fear overcomes us all the time, doesn't it? And it robs us. It robs us from doing and being the people that God's called us to be. The second question that Jesus asked was, do you still have no faith? So here we have Jesus, and he'd been walking with his disciples over a period of time, and and he was wanting to teach them and train them, and he was in hope that that they would start to get a sense of an understanding of who was walking with them, a revelation of God the Father through Jesus. Because at a time in the future, he was going to leave them with the job. He was going to leave them with an assignment. He was going to leave them with a task that if they did it well, they'd pass it on to future generations and generations after that. Until every tongue, tribe and nation had an opportunity to hear the gospel and to live it out and to see community change and transformation. You know, when Jesus asked the question, do you still have no faith? You know, very often, when, at least when I first came to know the Lord, this whole concept of faith was very new to me because I didn't grow up in a church situation. I came from a very unchurched background. And so was, what was faith? What, what, what did that concept mean? I knew that I had this relationship with God, that he was a talking God, that I loved him with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. He was the most precious one that I'd ever met, and I was never going to let him go. But I didn't actually understand that that's what faith was. Faith was a relationship in the living God. It was a relationship that I encountered with God and walked with God every day. It wasn't aimless. It was directed. It was directed towards a person. It's a person that I could know and understand. It's a person that I could uh, communicate with. He was a person that gave me direction, instruction, shared with me his heart for the world around me. 
And in this case, you know, Jesus in this boat, when he was turning to his beloved disciples, he was wanting his disciples to see him in a way that they hadn't seen him before. He was wanting his disciples to trust him. And in trusting Jesus, they would trust the Father. Because that was the sole purpose of Jesus, wasn't it? The sole purpose was to give glory to the Father, to to make a way to the Father, to bring revelation of the Father. Why? Because he loved the Father so much. And because the Father longed so much for relationship with the precious people that he had created. You know, often we're afraid of what we do not understand. And, you know, that can even be that we're afraid of what we do not understand about God. And so we tend to hold back. When God gives instructions, we hold back because there are certain aspects of our relationship with God that we, we simply do not understand. You know, there are certain things about the way God moves that we wish he didn't move that way because it's outside of our comfort zone and we would hate it if he instructed us to move that way also. Very often we're afraid of difference. We often judge things by our circumstances, not by our understanding and knowledge of God. You know, but God wants us to judge this world and our circumstances by our understanding and knowledge of who he is, of his nature and character. You know, that's really what he was wanting his disciples to pick up on in that boat. That even though there was a fierce storm, that they had Jesus right there asleep, so they were safe. And that as they woke him up, not necessarily with shouting, but gently, that he would do something that only he could do in that situation and it would be okay. At least they went to him with all their levels of misunderstanding of who he was. But you know, when God moved in that situation, when the power of God came upon the fierceness of that storm, the disciples had just witnessed God in action in a way that they'd never seen him before. They witnessed the great authority and the great power of God. Yet the scripture so clearly says they were terrified. They're asking one another, who is this man? Who is this man? They still didn't know him. They were on the journey to know him, but they still didn't know him fully. They were still searching and trying to discover. You see, he didn't fit any box He didn't fit any protocol, both either visible or invisible. He didn't fit. Because you see, he was here to bring revelation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was there at that time to bring the kingdom of God to the earth. He was there so that the disciples, that that small band that, that, that he called to himself, He was there so that they would see God and then take God to the very ends of the earth because he was the hope for the nations. He was the hope for cities. He was the hope for villages and communities. But yet they were still asking that question because they were still on a journey to know him. You know, following here in this passage, it goes on into Mark 5, of course, and here's where the purpose becomes really, really interesting because as soon as the boat crossed to the other side of the lake in, in Mark 5, uh, what, what Jesus encounters as he's walking along is a demon-possessed man, and uh, he calls himself Legion. Initially, Jesus speaks to this demon-possessed man and commands the spirit to leave, and Uh, The spirit doesn't leave. And so he says, what is your name? Who are you? And he says, this man uh, responded by saying, we're not just one demonic force. We're many. My name is Legion. But the the powerful part of this story is that Jesus speaks to, to Legion. And Legion, you see at this time, which is a group of 
evil spirits that had possessed this man are, are begging uh, that Jesus sends them somewhere, not into the abyss, but sends them somewhere uh, so that they have another house to inhabit. So Jesus looks around and he sends them into this herd of pigs. Now, in one foul, in one foul swoop, in one decision of Jesus at that particular time, he wrecks the economy of that district because what happens is once the demons go out of this man and into those pigs, they go over the side of a hill and that's the economy of those particular group of herders at that time. Sometimes Jesus does things in ways that we don't always understand. But what, what we see in this story is a man that's been set free, a man that's had an encounter with Jesus, a man that had a revelation of Jesus, that in many ways was seeing him a little bit more clearly than the disciples were up until that point. And he immediately loved Jesus and he wanted to go with him. And Jesus said, no, I, I, you can't come with me, but what I want you to do is I want you to go back to your family and I want you to tell them everything that happened to you. And so this man went on a journey and it says he went through 10 cities, which was the region that he lived in. And he became this extraordinary evangelist. And we know at a later time that much of that region heard the gospel through this particular man that was set free by the power of God at that moment. We have legions in this community. And the way to encounter them is to go out onto the streets and, and, and to ask God to lead you to them because you have the authority to set these people free. And then they will go in turn into their communities and they will tell many people about what Jesus has done for them. And whole communities will begin to come to know the Lord. Now, because of the economy issue, the people that lived in this area begged Jesus to go back to the other side of the lake. Okay, that's all they could handle of him at that point. So he went back to the other side of the lake. And as soon as he arrived on the other side of the lake in Mark 5, he encountered a gentleman called Jairus who was a leader of that community. And, and Jairus begged Jesus to come and heal his daughter. Now, his daughter was about to die, and, and, and he begged Jesus, if you come, she'll be healed. So on the way, Jesus met a woman who had pushed through the crowd. Now, this particular woman had been very ill for 12 years, and she'd used all her funds and her finance to, to go to many doctors to try and get well. And she hadn't succeeded in getting well. But she had this thought. She'd heard about Jesus. She'd heard about what he'd done for other people. And she had this thought, if only I could touch him. So she pushed her way through the crowd and she did touch him. And Jesus healed her immediately. Now, Jesus turned and he, and he faced this woman. And he was, he was looking around in her vicinity and he said, who touched me? And she, she put up a hand and, and she said, I did. Now, this is the part of the story I love here because Jesus immediately looked at this woman that had experienced so much shame through her infirmity for 12 years and he called her daughter. Just with that one point of communication, he gave her back her dignity. He gave her back her respect. He... he he drew a circle around her related to who she belonged to. She belonged to Jesus. She was loved. She was a beloved. And then he went on to say, your faith has made you well. You see, that was an encounter with Jesus where this woman had faith and she had this idea, if only I could touch him. I wonder how many people in our community have that thought. If only I could touch him. If there, if there was actually a God and if I could have an encounter with him, my life would be changed forever. Uh, you know, I want to say to you that there are literally thousands of people in this community that would ask that question in crisis on a daily basis. They're just waiting 
They're just waiting for us. They're waiting for us to, to be carriers and messengers. We have good news to bring. How do I know that? Because I've been in cities and nations and the Holy Spirit has led me to so many people that have been people that when I've stopped them, when I've been led to them, it's been a point of crisis for so many of them. I remember after the Bali bombings, I was in my own city, in the city of Perth where I live. And uh, I was out on the streets and I was, uh, you know, with a group of people and we were just sharing with the city about Jesus. And there was this woman and she came across, she was rushing across the city with a young man close behind her. And, and, and Jesus said to me, go and talk to her. Now, that was breaking protocol. She was clearly in a hurry. She was racing across the city and she had purpose and direction. And I, I went across because that's the person that Jesus wanted me to talk to. And I said, excuse me. And she stopped and she looked at me and I said, look, I've come because Jesus has identified you in the crowd. And he wants me to speak to you. And she immediately got her tears in her eyes. And she began to weep. And she said to me, before I left my home this morning, I was looking in the mirror and I cried out to God. And it's the first time that I can remember, she said, that I ever have. And she said, I said to my mirror and to this God, whoever he was, if you're real, I need to know you right now. And then she got in a vehicle, they'd parked it, and they were racing. And where they were heading was to the Royal Perth Hospital. Um, her, one of her daughters was in intensive care in the B Burns unit of the Royal Perth Hospital. She'd just been flown in from Bali, Indonesia. She was in that nightclub. But there was two of her daughters that were in that nightclub. One had lost her life immediately. And the other one had just been flown in to Perth and was at risk of losing her life. I, I, I said what Jesus had told me to say, which was simply that he wanted to reassure her that he loved her very, very deeply and that he was there with her at that point of her pain. And at that point, I didn't know what her pain was. She quickly shared it with me, and she said, I must rush. My daughter has just been, you know, they've just landed. Uh, they've just taken her into Royal Perth. But, you know, Jesus, Jesus knows and understands the, the depth of the pain and the depth of the wonder and the breakthrough and the depth of the joys of every person in this community. But, you know, we, we must know God to be carriers of that. And, I, and I, think that, I think that what Jesus was in the business of doing with his disciples is that they would come to a, more and more of a revelation of the greatness and the wonder and the magnificence and the power and the authority of Jesus so that they would be absolutely convinced of the one that they were going to share about, talk about, carry to the very ends of their known world. And, you know, so in this situation, there was this woman who had reached out and, and Jesus gave her dignity at that moment and he told her, go in peace. And uh, she left and he said, your suffering is over. And you know, God, that, that's our God. That's our God. He doesn't so much look at how we got into our painful situations, but he is very intent on bringing revelation of himself and seeing people in our communities set free. And he said to this woman, your suffering is over. What's our approach to Jesus? Because I think this woman was wonderful. She had an idea. She just thought, look, even if it doesn't work, I'm going to give it a shot. Jesus loved her faith. And you know, I, I believe that God is looking for men and women who have faith. And you know, just in the short journey and the little bit that I know of this incredible congregation here, I, I, I came here today with this great excitement uh, just to communicate with you that the best is yet to come. But through steps of obedience and faithfulness, there's foundations that have been laid. But God wants you to approach him with tremendous faith. To understand that you're on a journey, a little bit like Abraham. And Abraham was declared a man of great faith. He was a friend of God. 
He was a friend that knew and understood God. God loved to fellowship with him. God loved to lead through his servant Moses. God loved to speak through him. And then God used him as a tremendous leader that brought a whole generation of people, you know, through some pretty powerful and miraculous things. And they weren't always the best people to lead. They weren't always the easiest ones. They're often grumbling and complaining and blaming God. But you know, the world that God has called us to is not perfect. But it's a world that desperately needs him. It's a world that's been made to know him and understand him. And to me, you know, faith is a relationship with a powerful God. And uh, that powerful God is wanting to take us on a journey to, journey to change the world. And, and I, I wonder um, what that might look like in the area that your congregation is located in. Jesus did good on his way. It wasn't so much a project, it was on his way, it was in life, he did good. And, and it, the, the scripture says that there was so much that he did that it was difficult to write it all down, there was too much. But you know, dear ones, God wants to move in that same power through you. And he wants to anoint you to do good on your way. Jesus was training his disciples to trust, to rely to depend. You know, God does want us to get desperate, but desperate in the right way. I will not move without you, Lord. I will not move unless I hear your voice. But when I hear your voice, I will do what you tell me to do, the way you tell me to do it, even if that means I have to break protocol. Jesus coming into the world break, broke protocol, didn't he? His whole life was breaking protocol because he was concerned about glory for the Father. He was concerned that we get revelation of the Father. And this city needs revelation of God once more. It needs to see Jesus. There have been so many various times, even in this church, where God has moved in such powerful and incredible ways. But he wants to move that way in this generation. And he wants to mobilize this small band of people to change this community forever so that when people walk your streets, they will see Jesus. When people walk your streets, they'll press through crowds and say, if only I can have an encounter with that man or that woman of God because they know God. And if I have an encounter with them, then maybe I'll be healed. Maybe I'll be set free. Maybe I'll be able to go to sleep tonight, free from suffering, at peace. God wants to use you. You don't have to wait until the church has to have six services a day. God wants to use a small band of people to change this community forever so that the kingdom of God would be able to be seen and heard and understood on the streets of this city. You know, once the disciples got it, and this is the thing that I aspire to because I, I'm on this same journey of getting to know God more. But the thing I noticed about the disciples is once they got it, they were willing to give their lives for it. Once they got the full revelation of God. And you know, they, they would respond to the impossible from that point on the same way Jesus did, the same way they'd seen Jesus. And you know, we know something of this, the disciples, they all lost their lives the same way their master did because they were passionate about the world knowing what they knew and understood about God. What does God want to do in your part of the world? God wants to use this church. I, you know, I, I believe that God, you know, one of the first persons I met when we were when we came here to talk about megacities and the possibility of megacities coming and partnering with this city for for a, a short period of time the 12 months that we have was was Rick and Louie and um, I was just so encouraged to meet them because they're men and women of faith 
And, um, but, you know, when you've got leaders that have faith, then God, God, that's the seed of what God begins to want to do with bringing a group of people. And, you know, when, when Paul spoke to the church, he didn't speak to a few people doing much. What his aim was in discipleship and church planning was all members anointed by God to take communities that they lived in. And God has anointed this church in so many ways with so much talent and so much gifting. I just believe in this small group of people, you could literally change your borough forever. God has said so much, but what more does he want to say? And how does he want to come in greater power and greater authority upon you? Does he want to use you to calm the storms? Does he want to use you to deliver people from legions? Does he want to use you to heal people that have been suffering for many years? Does he want to use you to multiply food resources, economic resources? Does he want to use you beyond the health system to see people healed and restored? Now, you might say, surely he's already doing that. But what God wants to say this morning is there's more. There's more of knowing Jesus. There's more of that authority that calmed those waters, that silenced that wind. There's more of the power of God as we get to know him that he wants to to bring upon this congregation that would break out of this church to this community and beyond. God wants to make you city leaders. He wants to multiply you. He wants to send you, not just into the city, but into the nations of the earth. You know, it was out of this city that people came to my nation and brought the gospel. And I'm grateful for that. Part of the reason for the missions conference that we're just about to have is to express our deep gratefulness for missionaries that have literally laid down their lives. But a burden I carry for your city and for your nation is that we would see those wells unblocked and that you would begin again as a nation to become one of the major mission-sending nations in the world, across the street, across the city, and across the world. So if you identify yourself as someone that where God is stirring you this morning, that there must be more, and God, I want to be one of those disciples that is used by you in greater power, I'm certainly one of those. I just want you to stand with me this morning as we invite the worship team to come back up. And we're just going to commit that to the Lord and just invite Rick to come up.